All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk about optics here. Optics is the study of light and particularly how light interacts with matter like lenses and mirrors and also how light interacts with itself. Um, and, and we'll get into some of that and see what's happening. But uh, on your uh, right there, you see um, a piece of glass up at the top. Uh, that piece of glass is scattering the light. It's separating it into the uh, constituent colors. So white light is made up of all those colors. Uh, that's one of the things that we want to talk about. But that prism up there, that piece of glass, is separating this band that's coming in from the, from the right-hand side there and separating it out. And uh, that's a fascinating thing. Light's always been fascinating. Here's kind of a list of some people that have thought about light, scientists and eminent thinkers that have uh, studied this over the... The millennia. Um, you can see that this goes way back to at least 350 BC. Uh, Democritus and Aristotle were mixing it up trying to to win out because they had two different ideas. One of them said that light was a particle, that it was like a little ball bouncing around. Uh, and you can kind of see that when you think about reflection. The angle that a ball hits at is going to be equal to the ball that the uh, the angle that the ball bounces out at, and light does exactly that. And so Democritus and Alhazan and Newton and Einstein and um, some of those people thought of it as a particle. On the other hand, it has some wave properties, and we can think about light like a wave that uh, refracts or bends when it goes through certain materials. Aristotle, Descartes, Hooke, uh, all those guys over on the right-hand side at those uh, different years that you see there. So this has been going on a long, long time. If you want to know something more about that debate and that battle going on for all these, all this time, just look up Wikipedia, wave-particle duality. That's a good place to start and uh, to, get a, to get a handle on the history of some of these people that have, have picked one side or the other. So which one is it? Well, that's a good question. Um, last time when we were talking about electricity and magnetism, we saw that uh, there were some equations, at least if you're in 222. Regardless, even if you're in 202, um, you know that charge causes electric field. Right here in the picture, I've got a, a charge, Q, and you can see the lines emanating out from that. So that, that charge creates an electric field and uh, that's summarized in Gauss's law here. Now this is a calculus equation, um, but if you add up all those electric field lines, it's due to the charge that's in there. We talked about magnets, and we said that uh, magnets have continuous loops. It's not like an electric field where it starts at a point and ends at a point. Um, they just go all the way around continuously. So when I draw one of these little Gaussian surfaces here and add up how much is coming in versus how much is going out, I'm always going to get zero right there. So the second one here says that the uh, when you add up all the magnetic field lines, whatever comes into your surface also goes out. There's no magnetic monopole, no particle that's just a north pole or just a south pole. They all have both. Um, down here, Ampere's Law taught us that uh, anytime I have a current moving in a conductor, that that moving charge is going to generate a magnetic field. And so you see that right there in the picture, and you see it right here in the equation, that when I have a changing flux, a changing electric flux, when that uh, change in the electric field there is going to cause a change in the magnetic field, and I can add up the magnetic field and see what it's due to. Similarly, if I have a changing magnetic field right here, Faraday's law says you know, if I push a magnet into a coil of wire, that it will induce those charges, the electrons, to, to move. That creates a current and therefore an electric field. So the changing magnetic flux uh, will add up to uh, the electric field right there. Uh, and so we saw that the electricity and the magnetism are all tied together right here in optics because if I have a changing electric field that creates a changing magnetic field and the changing magnetic field creates a changing electric field and those two just keep driving each other and they propagate through space as light. All right uh, here's a little picture of that now this is you know using the wave model right here but you can see that if I had an electric field that was oscillating going up and down in the vertical plane right there that that would create a magnetic field that was oscillating perpendicular to itself 
and together those two would move forward through space uh, at a velocity called c, or the speed of light. And when we measure that, that's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, or 300 million meters per second. Moves really fast. Um, now, Hertz was one of the people that kind of thought about some of this stuff, and uh, he actually experimented with it. And uh, his experiments kind of point to both being true. Right here, he had a circuit in his lab that had a resistor and an inductor, transformer, and a capacitor. And uh, you might have heard something about that an RLC circuit causes a, an oscillation that I can set up an a alternating source on that, right? And when I pass that through a transformer, it's going to step it up or down depending on the number of loops in each each coil, but uh, here we've we've stepped it up, so I've got a high voltage, and that high voltage comes over here and creates a, a spark, a, an arc between those two points. And so he was watching this arc and measuring it and seeing how far apart he could get it and everything. For some reason, he looked over across the lab, and there's a second coil over there, a second uh, little gap, uh, and uh, that one was sparking too, but it wasn't turned on or anything. And so what you had was the energy here, the electromagnetic radiation here was traveling across the room and inducing a spark over here. And this is pretty much how radio works, right? Um, you have a signal, you amplify it, and it gets broadcast across the room, across the world, whatever. Over here you have an antenna that goes into your amplifier and you can listen to the radio in your car. All right. That makes sense when you think about uh, Maxwell's equations. He's got a changing electric field here, which creates a changing magnetic field, which creates a changing electric field. And those go over there as a wave at the speed of light. And he was able to, to experimentally verify that that was the uh, speed of light. So here, you know, we were talking about light, but this is a radio wave. And um, that radio wave travels at the same speed. It goes through the same electric field, magnetic field, all that stuff, um, but it's it's wiggling faster or slower. I'll show you a picture in just a second with that. So this verified the, the wave properties of light or electromagnetic radiation. However, Hertz also was playing around and discovered the photoelectric effect. Uh, about 1887, he had some metal, and uh, if he shown if he would shine certain frequencies of light on it, then that light had enough energy to bounce electrons off of that, free electrons, and those moving electrons were a current and he could make electricity. Today we call this a solar cell or a photoelectric cell. Here's one you could buy from Radio Shack if we still had Radio Shacks. Um, but light would come down and it would fall on this surface right here and that would free up electrons and those electrons would jump to the other side and run down over here and you could use that flow of electrons as a current and um, you know run something or charge a battery or, or whatever alright so that's the photoelectric effect but the way to explain that is to assume that these these uh, this light coming in is in little particles and it bounces those electrons off that it has enough momentum to to drive those guys off of the metal so that kind of proved the the particle property. Um, so which one is it? Uh, here's another experiment you probably um, ought to hear about at some point in your life. These two guys, Michelson and Morley, had a uh, gizmo built up. And um, up here you can see that there's a little lantern or a little light source. And that shines light out right here. I've got a half silvered mirror right there. So some of the light is reflected and goes out to this mirror, bounces and comes back. And the rest of it passes through that half silvered mirror and uh, hits this mirror and bounces back. And when they recombine right there, they go this way, they go into this little telescope and you could sit there and watch that. Uh, these guys sat there and watched it for about 10 years, and people kept messing with this thing from about 1887 to the 1920s. And what you see is a is a series of lines like that. The the waves, and this is a wave model experiment here. The waves are either in phase or out of phase, and uh, so 
when by looking at these rings you can measure how much they're off now the thinking of the the whole lab here is kind of in this animation some light comes out of the lantern splits some of it goes to this mirror and comes back the rest of it goes to this mirror and comes back and it recombines right there and the distances are such that they should be perfectly in phase so that when the red dot and the blue dot get back together they're exactly in phase however we're moving through space, right? And see how this mirror is getting farther away and the blue dot actually has to go farther to catch it and then bounce and come back. So what that means is that the uh, those particles will be out of phase, like you see right there, the waves actually. And um, that's what they were looking for. And they were trying to prove that there was a medium that carried light. If I throw a rock into the lake, then... Um, the water carries that energy, carries that wave outward. And uh, if we're going to think about light as a wave, then the natural question is, well, what is the medium? What do I have to have there to, to carry that wave? And uh, if, I, if I suck all the air out of a jar or something, uh, light still travels through it. So it's not air that carries it. It's, you know, and they were looking for this stuff. They called it the luminiferous ether. And uh, this experiment said, no, nah, I can't find it. I can't see it. I can't detect it. And eventually they gave up and said, well, we guess light doesn't need a medium to uh, to travel. And maybe that's true. Uh, maybe they just didn't have the right device, right? Maybe this thing right here wasn't what we need to uh, to see that and measure it. But they would do this experiment and say March, and the Earth would be going one direction around the sun, and then six months later it'd be going the other direction. And they they spent a long time trying to work that out never could get it. So today we say that light doesn't need a medium. Eh, we might come back and revisit that, you know, as we learn more about dark matter, dark energy, something uh, out there may uh, change. But uh, at the moment, that's the, the feeling. Uh, here's another experiment. This guy named Young shined light on two little slits, like you see right here. And um, if you go with the particle model, if I stood and threw rocks at these two little skinny windows, and, and when I say skinny, they're really skinny, um, those rocks would pass through the windows and hit in pretty much two slits over here. Right? I'd, I'd get two patterns of, of um, rock marks on the wall. If I threw tomatoes, they'd all be smeared on those, you know, right behind those two, two windows. But that's not what I see at all when you do this experiment. See how in the double slit pattern, We've got this this on off on off thing. Uh, if it's a single sp slit, it smears out into this line. Instead of being just a single line, uh, I get this uh, dispersion here of it like that. So this one points back to the wave model again. Uh, at the bottom here, I've got parallel rays of light, parallel waves of light that are striking. Uh, right there's a slit, and right there's the other one, and um, when I let that light through there, it's going to expand concentrically outward, like you see it doing. Meanwhile, over here, I've got concentric circles. And sometimes the, the crest of one wave comes upon the crest of the other wave. And those two high points would add and give me an even higher wave. But sometimes the crest of one is the trough of the other one. So I've got, say, plus one on one side, adding to negative one from the other wave, and I get zero. It cancels out. And so right here you see, um, you know, say two, zero, two, zero, two, zero, and it's, it's adding up and canceling out. Uh, we call that uh, destructive and constructive interference when light waves add up or cancel out because you've, you're adding them together. And uh, we can talk some more about that somewhere else. But this is one of those experiments that shows light as a wave. So the battle went on and on for a while. Uh, here's a nice little picture that kind of shows all of the species that we're talking about, I suppose. Um, there's your wave in the back, if we think of it as a wave. And you can see that these waves are getting spread farther and farther apart as we move to the right. They're very tightly packed together here. Uh, we would say those have a high frequency. And the wavelength is the distance from one top to the next top. So the wavelength is spreading out. We're getting a, a high wavelength, a long wavelength over here. And we're getting a high frequency over here. 
but it has a very short wavelength. So those are inversely related. Um, the energy increases over here. When you're getting hit by more waves per second, that's a higher energy. And uh, some of these will will hurt you. Okay, You don't want to get hit with this high energy electromagnetic radiation here. Uh, for example, I've got gamma rays would be the fastest. Um, you can see that the wavelength here, 0 0.0001 nanometers, is very, very short. And as I move to the right, the wavelength gets longer and longer, up to, say, 100 meters or something over here in the AM radio band. Uh, FM is a little bit shorter, at about a meter. Here's some TV, although we don't do broadcast TV anymore. It's all digital. But uh, the radio wave band is over here, and you've got uh, infrared. This little slice right here has been zoomed out. So everything that our eye can see is that little bitty line right there. And we can't see infrared or radio waves. We can't see ultraviolet or x-rays or gamma rays. But... Uh, but all of that's the same thing. It's an it's a electric field and a magnetic field oscillating, and the speed at which they go up and down determines what kind of electromagnetic radiation it is, and they all travel forward at the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. If I want to get the, uh, the frequency and I know the wavelength or something, here's a real simple formula. The velocity is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. Now, the wavelength is measured in meters. You can see that right there. There's 100 meters, 1 meter, whatever. Um, the frequency is how many cycles per second, how many times it oscillates up and down. So over here, it's not oscillating up and down um, very fast. So I'd have that low frequency, uh, I, you know, maybe we'll say 2 cycles per second or something, right? Uh, over here... I might have 2,000 cycles per second, just making up some numbers. But uh, that, that frequency measured in hertz, or cycles per second, and when I multiply that by the wavelength in meters, then I end up with meters per second. The, the cycles is just kind of a number. It's not a real unit. So I just end up with meters per second there. If I know the frequency, then I can find the wavelength. Or if I know the wavelength, I can find the frequency just by, by working that out. Okay? Um, well, there were some guys about five years ago in 2015 that, um, finally captured a picture of both of these properties at the same time. Uh, they had a little bitty nano wire, a little bitty skinny wire. They shined a, a really bright, fancy laser on it and that excited the electrons and they kind of oscillated and then they took a uh, something like an electron microscope picture of that. Okay, This is what came out of it. And you can see it's kind of like a packet and it's kind of like waves. Uh, the link is there at the bottom if you want to, uh, to see that. This is from physics.org. In March of 2015, they, they uh, got the first picture of, of light as a particle and a wave at the same time. So what's the answer? Is it a particle? Is it a wave? It's both. It has different properties, and if you're looking for a wave, you see a wave, and if you're looking for a particle, you see a particle, and that's okay. Um, and, and we will kind of use both of those as we do the rest of this. So, uh, thank you very much. That's the first video, and we'll have some more. But uh, bring your questions to class, and we'll see what happens. Thank you.